We all have a tender heart at Christmas and Advent. It's part of the miracle of the season. And when we talk about Advent being about expectation, it's rooted in hope. So that's where my expectations get fulfilled, to see the gospel being practiced. That's when I go crazy, happy crazy. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Hello, everyone, and happy Advent. What a glorious time for us to come together and open and prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, that re-coming, that reversion of Christ every year that we're invited into. And I am blessed beyond measure to be here with my own pastor, Father Ed Steiner from St. Phillips in Franklin, Tennessee. Father Ed, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm looking forward to our time together. And what a delight because I said to him earlier, I'm like, this is really an act of trust. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you're going or what you're going to ask. I don't either. <laughs> but I do trust that the Holy Spirit will guide me. And we were just talking for a few minutes about Advent and Father Ed has met my littlest many, many times before. And I was sharing with him that in the first Christmas podcast that she did, because she's in it every year with her older sister, Mindy, that I asked her about the meaning of Christmas and so insightful for a small child yet with the purity of heart that we're all called to she said Jesus is coming into our hearts again and Father Ed you may know this recently I spoke about the Immaculate Heart of Mary and just really our own hearts and that call every day to open our hearts to the Lord for like Ezekiel says for our hearts to be hearts of flesh for them not to be hardened in any way but to be so open to the love and the joy and the goodness of God so Before we explore Father Ed's story and the season of Advent, let us begin in prayer. Father Ed, will you please open us in prayer? Sure. Well, we always begin prayer, as Paul tells us, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, our Father, your Son revealed himself to us as an innocent child. Help us to make our hearts ready to see that innocence once more. Help us to see the quiet of that little town of Bethlehem, where our hearts can be still and we can hear your Son speaking to us. Help us, too, to be those shepherds. Shepherds, those shepherds who come, may we always be looking for the star that we call Christ. Help us this Advent, Lord, to make this journey in good faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. And I love how you use the word shepherd and shepherds already because, Father Ed, when I think of you, I think of a, a shepherd, a very good shepherd to us as your flock. And a song that's come to my heart a lot before, it was really written for the Lord, yet we're called to obviously reflect the Lord as a good, good father because as a family and St. Philip's being our spiritual home, there's all the highs and lows. There's all the things. There's all the different people, all of God's children in one place. And you're very smooth and steady and very contemplative and quiet. And I just think of you in the stillness like you talked about in your prayer and how what you say and do comes from there. So I'm so looking forward to really learning more about you because you decided to say yes to Mamas in Spirit. (laughs) (laughs) Happy to. So I would love if you could share really any stories from your own life that really remind you of allowing Jesus into your own heart again and witnessing that in your life. Sure. Sometimes the correlation between an event and directly comparing it to God is not there or Christ, but what is there, we learned something from those early events. I remember my mother just swears I can't remember this, but she remembers it. She said, you're only four or five, but we were having dinner. Our doorbell rang, of course, being the oldest. I scrambled to the door to answer it, and I opened up the main door. And on the other side of the storm door, there stood Santa Claus. I was beside myself. Just sort of fell backwards, stepped back. My father came walking out, and he said something to Santa. I don't even remember any of that. And I know I sat on his lap. My father took our picture. We still have the picture. But what's interesting is the connection I'm going to make to Advent is that I looked for that Santa to come to my door every year after. So there was this expectation, this hope that Santa's going to show up again. Never did, but I still kind of live with that expectation. And in some ways, that's what Advent helps us do to build our expectation of, of, of Christmas. 
And I love Advent. It's my actually my favorite season of the year because it can be a very contemplative time if we don't go crazy trying to get ready for Christmas. We set our expectations so high that doing everything we can do to get ready for Christmas, throwing up trees and decorations and buying presents, that we just don't enter into it. And the one thing about Advent is that in our liturgical church year, we begin retelling the story of Jesus Christ all over again. In fact, in just two weeks, the Feast of Christ the King of the Universe, that's the last Sunday of our church year. And on that day, we will celebrate something that hasn't happened yet, you know, the coming of Christ and then the time. That's part of our huge faith. And then the very next Sunday, we start over with the story. Every year we go through the story of Christ, our lives are different. We've had different experiences. Somebody's died, somebody's gotten sick. We hear the same scriptures, but they're different. And Advent helps us do that. Now, this is more of a Christmas thing, but I think it helps. In my father's family, there were eight children. One died rather young, but they all had buku children. So growing up, by the time the last grandchild came, I had 26 first cousins. So it was a heck of a party. My grandmother's house, my grandmother, my grandfather. But what they did was very smart, thinking of their children. They had so many. On Christmas Day, they had one requirement, stay at the house until they get there. Because my grandfather went around to all of the houses, and he had a 16 millimeter camera. And most people in those days had a little 8 millimeter. So this is a bigger deal. And he would film all of us around our Christmas tree, showing off our presents. Father had it all transferred to video, but this was filmed. So I can go back now and I can look at myself when I was three and four years old below our Christmas tree. And I still remember some of those presents, especially some of the things Santa brought. But we waited. And then the deal was, if we would wait, they would film us. They went on to the next home. We didn't go to their house on Christmas Day because he said it's not fair to everybody try to haul all the kids around. So you were expected to go to your in-laws on Christmas Day. And then about halfway between Christmas Day and New Year's, they would have a huge party at their house. and Everybody better be there. But again, to use that word expectation, the expectation was so high for that party because there were cousins at that, maybe Thanksgiving, Easter. There were only times I would see some of them. You know, so it was just that expectation of seeing family, being with family. And we need to do things in our Advent that builds that sense of expectation. As we begin Advent, we're trying to build that expectation of Christ the King where we're looking at expectation of Christ to come again. Oftentimes I refer to Advent as we're getting ready for Christmas to celebrate the birth of the Lord. I said, you know, it's really kind of a rehearsal for preparing our hearts for the Lord, all the things we do. I was in a classroom years ago when I was pastor at St. Joseph, and I love going. There was this one second grade class that the kids were just wonderful. So I went in, we were talking about a variety of things. I was just talking to them. And I said, does anybody know where the North Pole is? Of course, hands go up and they're all swinging their hands. And I'd call on one and they'd be so shocked I called on them and said, oh, I forgot, you know, or uh, uh, I don't know, but one girl, I thought her arm was going to come out of the shoulder socket. So I called on her and I said, okay, where's North Pole? And she said, you drive straight to heaven and then you turn right two blocks south. <laughs> I have the teacher laughed, but that's the connection of a child. I have that in some ways, very deep theological kind of thought for that child to connect what Santa does to heaven. That's a huge connection. And we all want to make it a lot better. This is something that any family can do because we all have our manger sets and crash crib. There was a family that invited me out to dinner. It was about middle of Advent. And so I go, we have a nice meal. Kids are great. They're younger kids, older than toddler. They're all young grade school. Well, one of the boys started saying, Daddy, why are we going to tell stories? I want to tell stories. And Dad said, well, Father's here. Let's enjoy his company. We'll do it in a little while. But he was so persistent. We want to tell stories. So I asked the father, his name was Ted, I said, Ted, what is he talking about? And he said, oh, well, every evening after dinner, we go to the manger scene. And one kid every night, and they, of course, cycle through, cycle through, where well, they pick one of the figures in that manger set, and they have to make up a story about that figure, about who is it, what's that figure's name, why did this figure go to see the baby Jesus? And, and like a lot of people, the baby Jesus wasn't in the manger. It was everything but. And so the kids would talk about how excited this character was going to be when he got to see the baby Jesus. And the one that did the story that night talked about how his mother and father was really sick, this little shepherd boy. And he didn't know what to do, but he heard this king was coming and he thought kings can do anything. So found his 
way to the manger to meet the king, to ask the king to take care of his parents. And I thought, oh my gosh, kids can tear you up. It was a marvelous thing, marvelous thing for a family to even think of doing that. I don't know where they got it from, but I thought, what a great idea. So marvelous. Yes, I love that so much. And it's so funny, Father Ed, because we're very blessed that both sides of Brian's and my family are very involved in our Christmas season and our Advent season and all the things. And so I've actually, as I'm getting older, I'm thinking, well, what traditions have I really created? And I don't know that that really matters so much because we have all these beautiful traditions, yet something like that to add in would be just glorious. Oh, absolutely. Again, growing up during Advent leading up to Christmas every night after dinner, back in the days when we all really ate dinner together, my father would read a portion of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, and we were just mesmerized by it. And and he had it all timed out, so every evening we'd do part of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol and then we get to the part where he wakes up in his Christmas day. And it was in a set of books, story time or something like that, kind of a fancy looking set of books. So after my father died, my mother was cleaning the house and it's like, we don't need this, we don't need that. She said, oh, we can get rid of these books. I said, don't you dare. So those books are in my room. And to this day, I reread Christmas Carol every Advent. Charles Dickens was, he was really into social justice. And Advent and Christmas, what's so great about Dickens and reading it, it's a story of redemption. But all also helps us open our eyes to the question, why did Jesus come? You know, that question needs to be asked. Why are we doing this? Why are we putting trees in the house? Why are we putting candles in the windows? Why are we doing all this stuff? And Dickens, there's a point where Christmas present is taking Scrooge to a place where there's a lot of poor people. And Scrooge, he had already said, well, aren't there places for people to work houses? Well, there's these two figures under the robe of Christmas present. And Scrooge notices these figures are moving. He said, what's that under your robe? He opens it up and there's these two horrible looking children. And Scrooge says, well, who are they? He said, they're man's children. They are ignorance and want. The downfall of humanity, ignorance and want. And want meaning needing sustenance. You know, want is more than, oh, I I, want to have that bike for Christmas. The real word want means there are things that I need to survive. That's to want, that's hunger. So Advent, to really keep us focused on why Christ came. If we can't use Advent to focus on why why Jesus came, well then Christmas doesn't have a lot of depth of meaning to it. Yes, I so appreciate that. And it's so lovely listening to you, Father Ed, and I'm realizing something that's much deeper. And it's not something exactly that you said, but it's your entire kind of being and spirit. And you did touch upon it when you talked about waiting in expectation after that first year that Santa showed up at your door as a small boy, that you would then expect that every year and that you still do. You still have your own sense of expectation. That really shines through and that's really beautiful and moving. And you have many memories. You've lived a good (laughs) good life. And you're a pastor, you're a shepherd, you walk with a lot of people and you walk with a lot of people who literally are poor and hungry at times. And then also people who are struggling and suffering through all the things. We couldn't even list them. And I can only imagine how many that you have heard over your career and your vocation and calling as a priest. Could you speak to that? How is your heart going back to what my little said that this is a time where we are waiting because Jesus is coming into our hearts? hearts again. I see that in you. Like you still have an open heart and probably a reopened heart so that you can live in the expectation and the hope of love itself, of God, Mm -hmm. of Christ and why Christ came. How is that? I know it's a grace and a blessing. How have you been blessed with that? I think, and especially at St. Philip, wonderful parish. And I've been in multiple parishes. I was at Father Ryan High School. I worked at Fort Campbell as a chaplain there. I mean, I've done all kinds of things, but I don't say this flatter myself, but because there was a spirit at St. Philip before I got there. And it is a spirit that's truly connected to the community, to the city, and to outreach. And what I see in terms of that fulfillment of that expectation is that the parish between the Christmas basket program and all these other things, it becomes so mobilized to reach out to those that are in ignorance and in want. So mobilized. And part of the Christmas basket week that we have, part of my expectation, is that this is really fun. I can't wait till it happens. But what What we see when parishioners deliver all of those Christmas baskets, you run into people who in many ways have lost hope, who in many ways feel forgotten. I'm an elderly person. I'm here all by myself in this house. We're impoverished, living in the black area, and it's just poverty all around us. Even here in Franklin, people don't realize it. There's people that their incomes are okay, but they've just lost a loved one. 
So for parishioners to walk in or me to walk in, you see people, like I said, that in some ways have lost hope. They're very lonely. And all of a sudden, you see countenance change. You know, you see people's faces change. You know, they might say, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. And it's these parishioners from St. Philip bringing us food to eat. But one of the, it didn't happen at St. Philip, but in a similar kind of thing in another parish, one family, they were really scared to do this, so to take the food. So I'll go with you. So, you know, they went to the house, very important impoverished sheets for the windows, the house. You kind of felt the breeze coming in the house. And the kids just started picking through the box. Now, they had wrapped presents, which Mama told them, those go under the tree. You can't open those. But then there were toiletries and all of that. Well, there were enough toothbrushes for each of the kids to have a brand new toothbrush. One of them just started crying, just started crying. And I asked, what's wrong? What's wrong? She said, this is the first time I've ever had my own toothbrush. Of course, your heart just drops to your toes. To hear a small child in this country say, this is the first time I've had my own toothbrush. It makes the huge gifts at Christmas seem kind of meaningless when that child finds such joy and excitement in a toothbrush. And so when we talk about Advent being about expectation, it's rooted in hope. So that's where my expectations get fulfilled, to see the gospel being practiced. That's when I go crazy, happy crazy. I love what you just said about the gospel being practiced, because I just wonder if sometimes we can get so caught up in like the right booklet, (laughs) you know, the right reflective book or whatnot. But yet this is a glorious invitation for us to do all these things. And I have memories flooding back to my own heart of going into senior homes. Last Christmas time, we went with the Girl Scout troop that I lead into the Christmas home and a man was new there and he was crying at first. It was so sad in the memory care section. And then he was a singer. The girl started singing. Oh my goodness. This man, I wondered if he had been like a famous singer. Uh-huh. His voice was so glorious. And then he started leading, oh, when the saints go marching in and all the things. <laughs> but like you're saying, witnessing that transformation that only God can give, mm-hmm. that glorious transformation. And the other thing that came to heart when you started talking about St. Philip's is how this goes on every day, not just only in Advent. Right. That St. Philip's has its own food pantry and its own clothing closet. And oftentimes in daily mass, I see people out there either going into them or waiting for them or, and it's deeply moving. And Israel is someone that I want to get on Mamas in Spirit because I watch these people like Israel from St. Philip's who does the food pantry. And I think he's like Jesus. Absolutely. In fact, before you even said his name, I started thinking about Israel. You know, as I told some of these stories, there's the forgotten, the hungry, people without family and all of that. Well, when people come into our building and they go to the, and for some of your listeners who don't know what this is, we just have parishioners bring food every weekend. There's food coming in and we have a closet, rather substantial, but we call it our food pantry and anybody can walk in off the street and help themselves to what they need. And it's never abused. I mean, people really walk in and take what they need, you know, whether it's canned food or box food or whatever it is. But as those people come in, Israel knows each and every one of them by name. I call that the Cheers Theology of Church, where everybody knows your name. Well, he's a force to be reckoned with because he is kind and he's gentle and he laughs. But at the same time, if somebody seems like they're abusing, he can still speak up and say, hey, now, you're not the only hungry person in the world. (laughs) I heard him say that to somebody. But they know him. And isn't that what we're all called to be? Again, go back to Dickens, is to truly see the world as, as a pilgrimage that we're all on together. Yes, to truly see the world as a pilgrimage that we're all on together and together as a family and God. Mm -hmm. Because the other memory that comes to heart is deeply personal. Someone always has to tear up in a Mamas and Spirit podcast, so I'm over here tearing up listening (laughs) to you. (laughs) But I think of our son because we adopted Henry when he was just shy of six and all that boy ever wanted was a father. I'm telling you, he was like, you're all right, but I really want him. (laughs) Oh, man. He really wanted my husband. And he moved in in the beginning of November. And then came Thanksgiving. And then came Christmas. And he has intellectual disability. So he's still like a small child. And his anticipation, his expectation of Christmas is unmatched. It is unmatched. And this year, pray for us, everybody. Brian's going to pick him up for Christmas. And I'm going to take him back (laughs) 
after he lives across the country. And it will be an adventure, but it will be a joyous adventure because he has a heart of Christmas. Absolutely. You know, and there's nothing better than taking a child to a theme park. My family lives in Florida, only about an hour, 20 minutes away from Disney World. So for years, I would take my nephews, would go up to Disney World, would spend a day up there at Christmas time. And of course, oh my gosh, Disney does Christmas like nobody else can do Christmas. But there's some rides. If I never went on again, it'd be okay. <laughs> like it's a small world because you go through that and you're singing that song in your head for you know the next week and you just can't get it out of your head. But to see the children light up and to experience that through their eyes. And of course, what happens at Christmas? If we just pay attention to the children, we can see Christmas through their eyes. The closer we get, the more they vibrate. <laughs> you know, they just crazy. And of course, there's nothing like the last few days of classes in a Catholic school with the kids. I mean, they're just forget teaching, whatever you could do to keep them busy. But the, from Santa Claus, believing is seeing. And that's what children do. That's what children do. I asked not too long ago, oh, a five-year-old maybe. I'm shaking hands as everybody comes in the church. I said, oh, well, why are you here today? And he said, I'm here to see Jesus. It's convicted in his heart. They get it. They get it. Children can be such a gift during Advent. I tell parents all the time, I said, it's sort of old-fashioned, but put those kids in your car and drive around the neighborhood, other neighborhoods, and look at Christmas decorations. Go see all the other houses. Oh, let those kids' eyes get big. Take them to some kind of Christmas special thing somewhere. To this day, I love walking around the Opryland Hotel when it's decorated for Christmas. Talk about getting in the mood. But, you know, you decorate, you know, you bake. But it's so important, that, like you just said a minute ago, to create those memories for the kids. And every year, you know, at the end of any of our Christmas masses, I tell the parents to bring their kids up to the manger seam, let them look at it, you know, just create memories because it's our expectations get built on those memories. Yes. And what I'm hearing from you is create memories that are etched deeply within our hearts forever because you're not a five-year-old boy anymore. <laughs> no, nope. I might act childish, but no. <laughs> Yet that still reverberates in your heart and has for your lifetime thus far. And that's so beautiful. And it's so funny, Father Ed, because I don't think about this very often. But as a child, my grandparents, they belonged to a country club and we would go there for Santa Claus. Well, you know who was Santa Claus was my grandfather. Oh, man. So we got to go in the front of the line before all the other uh -huh. kids. And then he would come out in the Santa costume on the balcony way on the other side of the ballroom it's very fancy place <laughs> and he would wave and say ho 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 and my grandmother would delight I remember that I remember seeing her joy in seeing my grandfather as Santa Claus and then we would always get to sit on his lap first as his children and he actually passed away when I was nine and that's how I discovered God as a child was when he passed away so there's just so much tied up in that and this is a, not a podcast where I usually say hey moms or dads if you're listening here are some ideas but this has been one of the the most meaningful things that my youngest child and I have done together that I believe our entire family has benefited from and definitely my own heart has before every season, like just summer, fall, winter, whatnot, but also the season of Advent and Christmas, we make a list of all the things that we want to do that are the most important. It could just be walking our dog through downtown Franklin to see the lights, like the simplest things, driving around, seeing Christmas lights, going to the Christmas concert that's amazing at St. Philip's like all the things and then we cut them up and we put them in the jar and anyone that's not like on a specific day or time we pull out when we have some time and we do that because it's those things Father Ed that you know or that I know that we'll cherish always because things can get too busy and in our family all of our children are December babies so December is nuts <laughs> yep. but it's not because we do we are blessed and try to have that intentionality of doing the things that are the most important. When you're talking about your grandfather, it brought a little something to mind. Somewhere along the line, I read the three phases of a man's life. First, he believes in Santa Claus. Second, he doesn't believe in Santa Claus. Third, he becomes Santa Claus. Oh. And I think that's the grandfather. To say this, Santa, kind of an older guy, so we a lot of times will associate our grandfathers with things like that. But for the grandmothers or whomever is listening, make sure that the grandfathers understand that when children visualize God, it's usually a composite of their grandfathers. Grandfathers don't realize how important they are because kids think there's this old man, God, he's bald, and he looks like he just walked out of the gym. 
you know, just buff and all that. But most boys, their vision of God, what they think God looks like is a composite of either one grandfather or both their grandfathers. And many, many people will tell you that it wasn't the fact that their parents were always going to church made them go. It's that their grandparents were going and they would take the kids with them. And like grandparents do, they'd make the kids behave at church. You know, they'd make them sit still and all that. But again, what's the power? Memory. Memory. With our own parents, we can kind of dismiss the things they tried to teach us. Of course, I discover, you know, the older I get, the smarter my parents were. Of course. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) here's why memory is important. Our prayer and our worship is based on a thing called mimesis. It's a Greek word. It means memory. But in the Jewish understanding of memory, and this is how the scriptures work, if you told a story, let's say you told a Christmas story, and I heard your story, and I thought it was great. I wasn't there, but next time I tell that story, I am allowed to put myself in that story. Because when you told me the story, I experienced it. So whether we're at, for those of us that are Catholic, whether at Mass, what are we doing? We're telling the story. When we read the scriptures, we're telling the story again. There's many times that the gospel writers will sort of make you believe they were there. Well, they weren't there, but they heard the stories and they retell them with a sense of their own presence. And that's ultimately how we experience things. It's through the power of those stories and being able to interject ourselves into those stories. But what are we doing around all of these holidays? Children learn more about their parents' family history through the holidays than any other time of year. Mama, what was it like when you were a little girl? What did Grandma do? What did Papa do? Just think about you and your husband, Brian, how many times you talked to your kids about what it was like when you were growing up. Like you said, creating memories so that they have stories to tell that they have stories to pass on to their children about what it was like when they were little. And, oh, you know, you didn't get to know your great-grandparents, but let me tell you something about them. And everybody, by the way we live, we write our own gospel, and we're called to open up the gospel. My father passed away. His name was Ed as well. At his funeral, I talked about the gospel according to Ed. He always had advice, so everybody just died laughing. And at a funeral, we don't want to ask why did this person die. We'll never have a satisfactory answer. it just frustrates us. Oh, we'll get to heaven. God might explain it to us. So you change the question. How was God present through this person's life? Not why did they die, but how was God present in their life and in their death? And then we can begin to see life's lessons, the gospel lessons start to unfold as we remember the person. What are we doing in Advent? We're remembering Mary and Joseph and betrothal and kind of a sticky kind of situation where Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant, but we're in those stories. Sometimes there's nothing I like more than once the house is all decorated for Christmas is just to turn off all the lights except the Christmas lights. It's just really nice. And I like to sit kind of close to this manger set I have because I can close my eyes and just put myself in that manger scene. That's sort of a meditative way of prayer in some ways. But we put all of these things together during this time of year. When I was at the high school for 10 years, I always gave the same penance every Advent. We had these big Advent penance services. So we'd have 900 kids. 600 kids. I mean, we'd have all these kids going to confession. I gave every one of them the same penance every year. After they confessed their sins, said, here's your penance. I want you to think of the most important people in your lives. And if money were no object, what would you give that person? What do they need that you can give them? And it doesn't have to be a thing. If they're sick, you can give them health. But your mother, your father, your siblings, your friends, the the people that are most important to you in life, think of them in terms of, if I could give them anything, not just the beautiful necklace or you know, but something that really helped complete them, what would that be? And I said, oh, okay. And I said, now make sure you do it, but write down what you would give each of them. That's so beautiful. I love that so much. Father Ed, I cannot thank you enough because through the delight of your stories and just yourself, it really shows us how these memories, these stories, these moments that we create that can be memories and stories for our children help us to open our hearts so that Jesus can come into our hearts again. We all have a tender heart at Christmas and Advent. It's part of the miracle of the season. We all get sentimental, so we need to use it well. Yes, praise God. Praise God. And it's on my heart too for anybody out there who may be struggling, who may be one of those people who are lonely during this time, please reach out at mamasinspirit at gmail.com. Send me a little note. I'd love to write you back and just encourage your heart and for all of us to remember that we are a human family of God's and that we are a spiritual family and that some way all of our hearts and our lives are knit together in the Lord. Father, I thank you so much. Can you bless us in closing? Absolutely. God 
God our Father, to convince us of your love, you sent your only Son into our lives. He came as a baby, delighting his parents. That child became our Savior. That child helped us in the moments in our lives where we desperately need hope, where we desperately need a sense of love and connection to you. Bless us, Lord, this Advent. Bless us in our Christmas that we might draw ourselves closer to you. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So we will be gathering with these Advent podcasts over the next few weeks. So exciting. And then close out season five of Mamas in Spirit with my beloved daughters, Brian's and my beloved daughters. And so just looking forward to being with you through all of this and just want to thank you for the blessing and the gift you are to me. Can't wait to be together again next time. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always. Thank you.